Hello, good evening. Um, thank you for coming. But of course, it's no surprise that the, the hall is nearly full. This is, after all, Vivek Shanbag and Srinath Perur, our very own homegrown. Um, so seven years ago in 2015, I had the privilege of doing the, the conversation that brought Ghachar Ghochar, um, I'd like to say, to the world. Um, and now uh, I have the same privilege and the same pleasure of doing this for Sakina's kiss. But as you can see from my voice, <laughs> I'm a little bit nervous. You know, Ghachar Ghochar, we didn't know how far it was going to go, but with Sakina's kiss, you know, we, we do. So um, despite the fact that we are very good friends and we're all very comfortable in this auditorium. You will forgive my um, nervousness. <clears throat> so, um, one of the things I think that everybody notices, whether or not we know you personally, is this remarkable fit that the two of you have as writer and translator. Um, and, um, for me, when I think about it, I was like, why do I think, why do I think this? Why do I feel this when I read the book or when I see you um, two together or separately even? And in my mind, I think what makes this relationship, this professional relationship very, very special um, um, is because both of you are gentlemen. Yeah, in the traditional sense of the word, but you are also gentlemen, which is a very rare thing, even in the 21st century. So, you know, my congratulations for being bad, but I think, don't you agree? Yeah, it's rare. Um, um, but I think that is, um, there is something um, in the delicacy of Vivek's writing that um, Srinath is able to capture in, um, in the English, right? So, um, how did you find each other? <laughs> it's like an arranged marriage, come tell. <laughs> I knew Srinath for a, for a long time before uh, he started work on, working on uh, Ghachar Ghochar. And he had shared some of his uh, stories with me. And when his book came out, I, uh, I felt that the kind of uh, uh, humor that he had and also the kind of voice that uh, was there in that book was something that was, you know, that would uh, suit uh, Ghachar Ghachar. And uh, I mean, not Ghachar Ghachar, but suit my kind of writing. That's what uh, it was more. And I asked Srinath, I remember it was in Koshi's we were sitting and I asked him whether he would like to translate. And he said he had never done any translations before. And that's how, that's how it started. And then, of course, we spent a lot of time together. And Srinath has other story to tell about this. About well, another plot hatched at Koshi's. No, what um, I mean yeah. is that it was, uh, it's something which, which started off as this, this conversation that I just mentioned, but it, it's something more than that, and which is why I said uh, what Srinath uh, says is more important, because it's, uh, uh, let him say it. You know, it, it's so good to be here. Thank you, Arshia. And okay. it's good to have a lot of family and friends here. Feel very warm and grateful. Um, yeah, so when, uh, Vivek uh, came to me uh, and asked me if you know, I would be interested in translating Ghachar Gochar. I was going through a kind of uh, small crisis of authenticity. My mother tongue was Kannada, but my working language was English, and what is this, and why am I like this, and so on. Uh, so I thought this is, a, and I was, my Kannada reading speed was so slow that I, I could barely get through anything. So I thought it would be good to uh, you know, have a project to do with Kannada so that I can take some time and engage with the language at leisure and do something. And, and I'm glad that, uh, I don't know if, you know, my engagement with Kannada, uh, you know, became uh, in any sense deeper or profound, but I lost that sense of inauthenticity. I mean, in the sense I'm okay with my inauthenticity now. So, uh, so, so Sakina's case I did from a, you know, uh, it, it was a different experience for me in some ways. I remember you told me um, when we were first talking about Ghachar Ghochar 
uh, you said, I learned my Kannada through translation. Um, I thought that uh, that was very modest. It was also very moving. But I'm also thinking, what a beautiful way to learn a language by translating, you know, the best of contemporary writers. You do Vivek Shanbag, then you do Girish Karna, then you come back to, <laughs> you know, I mean, um, yeah, you've, you've really sort of um, got the best of, of our times in, in Kannada writing. Um, yeah, I've been very fortunate, I think. Sorry? It, I've been very fortunate in the people I have translated. I mean, I have learned so much from all these three books. Yeah. Um, so who decided to do this translation? What, did you go to him or did you go to him? I went to Srinath. <laughs> okay, lovely. <laughs> and the book um, in Canada came out in 2020. Right? Sakina's case? Yeah. It was, no, it was in 21. 21, okay. Um, and you immediately said, yes, I want to do this? Yes, I read it. I love the book. And yeah. He had read it in manuscript itself. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So tell us, what is the book about Srinath? And then we see if Vivek agrees with you. Yeah. Uh, Vivek packs so much into his books that it's really hard to... Just one second. Lekha, yeah. can you please switch on the light so yeah, that we can bit, see um, the faces of the people? Thank you. Yeah, so Vivek packs so much into his books that it's really hard to, uh, you know, just describe in a few lines what, what the book is about. But uh, it, it is set in Bangalore. It is about um, uh, a couple, Venkat and Vijay. Vij uh, Venkat is a narrator. They both work in the IT industry. They have a daughter. And they have a reasonably, you know, they're, they're affluent, they have a good life. Still, there is something lacking at the core. And part of the reason that is happening is because uh, there is a sense of uh, uh, you know, dominance that uh, Venkat feels, uh, which is almost atavistic, which comes from deep within, uh, a sense of having to dominate over the women in his life which has created certain kinds of rifts in their lives. At one level, this is what very broadly the book is about. But at another level, it is also about, it is also deeply political and it is about how, uh, what goes on in our houses, what goes on in our heads and what happens in the culture around us in society. They are deeply interconnected. And uh, I think it is also a page turner. So it's a thriller of some sort, I think, if we can use that description. So it's all of these things. Would you agree, Vivek? Is it a thriller? <laughs> it's a very difficult question to answer because the format is that of a thriller. And I did that because it also reflects in a way uh, we behave in the current times. Okay. So the, the kind of pace that we uh, you know, the speed with which we would like to live is something I, I wanted to convey uh, through that. I, mean, I don't know if I'm successful or not, but that was the intention uh, behind that. No, I find it interesting that he says this because I also found it uh, timeless to uh, some extent. I, the book it most reminded me of in some way was Crime and Punishment because it has that fast-paced thing and it has this uh, very deep moral question at the center of it. And this also has, uh, you know, while being a fast-paced book, it has all these uh, profound questions that are being asked about what we know, how we know, should we want to know more, uh, so. Yeah, but you know, um, <clears throat> you said something, it's, uh, it's, it's, it feels like a thriller because this is the pace at which we want to live, right? Now, um, it's another Bangalore book, as Ghatar Ghatar was, but you know how Ghatar Ghatar really was like a miniature, no? I mean, there were squirrel hair brushes that were being used to draw some of the images, and um, and as, as you said the other day, you feel almost claustrophobic in Ghatar Ghatar because it's one location and one family, and <clears throat> there's a something rotten in the state of Denmark in that family. But Vivek here in uh, Sakina's Kiss, highly provocative title, um, um, you have such a large canvas. Yeah, there are so many characters. There is the city, there is the village. And, you know, uh, of course, the, the central characters, Venkat and Viji and their daughter, they link the city to the village. But it's, it's really very, very wide. Right? Um, so this, this pace at which we want to live our lives in the 21st century, 
um, what is that pace and what is it driven by? Because I remember in earlier um, conversations about the book, you said that in some way it's a book about globalization and the effect of globalization on a, on a, on a middle class, on a completely average, really quite boring um, middle class family. So what is this pace and what is this globalization? And how do we connect the village? See, it is... Uh if I have to say, if I have to point at one thing which has you know, impacted us in the last three decades, it is globalization and uh, open market economy. Because, and technology I would consider is part of this because without the infrastructure provided by the globalization and that kind of funding, the technology would not have survived or would not have flourished as it has done today. So for me, that is at the center of uh, the change that uh, uh, our country or, or even the world has undergone in, in the last three decades. And it is impossible for a writer not to respond to this because the change is so huge. And it is every day it is, you know, it is impacting, it is. And because of the change, you know, that conflict is there. And, and for literature, conflict is, you know, it's like a gold mine. It is uh, yeah. the conflict and... and uh, uh, the resulting, uh, you know, uh, tensions uh, is what uh, uh, is, I mean, it has been there for, in my writing all through, in some form or the other. And, uh, for example, I wrote a story in 1992, nearly 31 years ago, and it was called Riding the Tiger. Mm. And the story had a background, it was, it is set in, uh, you know, in a, the background of that was, uh, game in a corporate training center. And as the story progresses, the line between you know, the, the game and the reality, it blurs and so on and so forth. And now I feel, looking back, that the title, I mean, of course, the story was not much discussed in Canada for the first three years. But later on, after 95, it was vastly discussed. And it's, uh, you know, so many people recognize me by that story now. But I, the point I'm trying to make is that now when I look back, I feel that the title was, is more apt. We are on a ride which is, uh, we can't get off. I mean, the tiger will eat us if we, if we get off. So that is something which is there at the center of it. If you ask me, Ghachar Gochar was also uh, in, uh, influenced by this without saying it. And one doesn't have to talk about globalization to write a novel about it or a story about it because it is all pervasive, everywhere it is there. And my concern has been, you know, not really, I don't want to say globalization because I don't talk about ideas. What I want to say is the stories. I want to talk about characters. I want to see how these things have impacted people. And that's really what I'm trying to do. Of course, now I can sit back and say, you know, it is globalization, this, that, all kinds of things. But really, uh, I don't want to write about ideas. I don't want to write about this. But I want to write about people uh, for whom this has, uh, you know, become uh, such a, uh, the kind of angst that it has created, the kind of uh, things, you know, happiness also. And globalization is one thing which is you cannot, you know, describe it in black and white. You cannot say it is good. You cannot say it is bad. And it is such a complex uh, thing. No, I, I think um, globalization is a, is a historical moment. Um, I guess maybe like World War II or the Industrial Revolution or something, which changes people's values. You know, so the fact that you mentioned happiness. And I mean, yeah, of course, there are many people who do talk about globalization in terms of ideas. But I think what you're doing is presenting the, the affect and the effect um, of, of these, you know, world forces on individuals, it is through their values. It is how they change um, and how they not just, you know, and how they inhabit the world, but how they change in their relationships with each other. Yeah, I, I feel really that uh, to understand the present times, fiction is the only way out, yeah. not, not non-fiction. Right? Yeah, That's my view, of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so I think what happens um, in um, Sakina's kiss is, you know, I, I was very taken by this, by the village interlude, as it were, because the book starts in the city and ends in the city, and yet um, 
what drives the plot is actually uh, located in in the village, right? And I remember Girish Karnad saying that um, for his generation of writers, whatever it is that they were writing, that the Kannada literary imagination was still stuck very much, not stuck, located in the village, in, in um, rural areas. And it's your generation, Kaikini, yourself, um, Divakar, um, Chittal, who have brought the city into um, Canada writing. So what I, what I felt um, in, in the book was, so in, in the city, one of the effects of globalization or one of the effects of a particular kind of urban modernity is the criminalization of the underclass, right? Of what we used to call in when we were all Marxist, Lupin proletariat, now we call them something else. Um, but the same thing somehow is reflected in the village, right, with the politicization of, um, you know, uh, working class people and the things they want and the things they believe that they can have. And, um, you know, sort of in a Naxal way, but much wider and deeper and perhaps even nonviolent um, way. So uh, your book opens, I have to say this, I'm sorry, I know I'm not supposed to talk about details, but the book opens with somebody knocking at the door. Right, and honestly, when I was reading it, I could only hear Beethoven, dun, 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 dun. and you know, of course, it's like fate and destiny and all that knocking on the door, and that's exactly what happens with this door knock, because somebody knocks on the door, and Venkat opens it, and ta-da! <laughs> it is. Uh, you made an important point about criminalization, because what happens is many times we. I don't see, or when we see the nexus between this uh, uh, criminals and politicians, we laugh about it. We make fun of it. Or sometimes we even say that it is, you know, what are, you know, we are living in such bad times and whatever. But we believe that it is something which will not affect us. We think it is something outside us because we are good people. Right? But I don't think it is any more true. Because the politics is all pervasive. Whether we like it or not, we have to be part of this politics. And that is something that is, uh, I feel is, uh, uh, you know, when you said about village or, or city or criminalization, all these things are somewhere uh, connected. And we have very little choice about this. And uh, it is, it, is, it has already, if not uh, entered, it is at the door. If not, it has you know, entered our homes, it's at the door. And when we really confront it in, in reality, we do not know how to respond to this. And that's uh, why, I, why you know, that's what I really feel. And that's, that's all these things have worked on my mind, I guess. When I, because you don't think about it and write, you know, you can only now talk about it. But uh, maybe some of these things have made an impact on me, yeah. Yeah, if I can say something about this. Uh, I've read uh, a couple of other books by Vivek, and even when he's writing about the city, the village always hangs over it. And understandably so, because a lot of the patterns of our thinking, of our lives, they come from, they're rooted in village life. And uh, the urban phenomenon is a relatively recent one. And also those two aspects you mentioned, criminalization in the city and uh, politicization in the village. So I couldn't uh, help uh, thinking of uh, what was going on maybe around 10,000 years ago in the uh, Neolithic when <clears throat> so uh, a lot of anthropologists believe that uh, the state of gender relations that has existed for a long time happened because of the way agriculture was practiced that once you had irrigated land that land grew enormously in value you had a certain surplus to protect protect which you needed sons and sons became be began to be valued and then you had Patri locality where women moved to that place and it grew from there into this whole complex that we have today and although we are not supposed to give away plot details as this is very insignificant there is a, a plot of land that is uh, causing a lot of troubles in the book and uh, so a lot of the politics in the village is going on around control of land and and this whole situation which led also to you know wanting to control women and so on it is, we see transfer to the city in some way where there are these goons who uh, deal not with land but with territory, territory that yields votes 
and they too are obsessed with uh, policing women. So I, I wonder how the parallel works here. Yeah, land and women and cows, women and cows, yes. <laughs> uh, so please, will you read um, what is a great opening scene? But yeah, I think everybody will, yeah. I will not read the opening scene. I'll read something about okay. uh, about the visit of some uncles. Ah, yes, yes. That's the same scene I went. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And I'll read that in Canada. And for people who know only English, Srinath will do that a little later. Not the same part, but something else. This is... Uh, there are two people who have, uh, who are visiting this family. Uh, <clears throat> and they are uh, thugs. Manju yara maga gota, Ranganaur maga sir, ade reporter Ranganaur. Ii hasar anno madalil lo keli dan titto. Avar yaru? ಯಾವ ಪತ್ರಿಕೆಯಲ್ಲಿ ಇದ್ದಾರೆ ಅಲ್ಲಿಯವರೆಗೂ ರಾಜ ಹೇಳಿದ್ದಕ್ಕೆಲ್ಲ ತನ್ನ ಮೋರೆಯ ಸ್ನಾಯುಗಳಿಂದಲೇ ಸಮ್ಮತಿ ಮತ್ತು ವಿಧೇಯತೆಯನ್ನು ತೋರಿಸುತ್ತಾ ಕೂತ ನಂದ ಟೂ ಪೀಪಲ್ ರಾಜ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ನಂದ ನಂದ ನನ್ನ ಅಜ್ಞಾನಕ್ಕೆ ಬೆಚ್ಚಿ ಬಿದ್ದವನಂತೆ ಕುರ್ಚಿಯ ತುದಿಗೆ ಜರುಗಿ ಬಡಬಡಿಸತೊಡಗಿದ ಏನ್ ಸರ್ ಹೀಗಂತೀರಾ ಸದ್ಯ ಹೊರಗೆಲ್ಲಾದರೂ ಹೀಗೆ ಹೇಳೀರಾ ಈ ಏರಿಯಾ ಫುಲ್ ಅವ್ರದೇ ಕಂಟ್ರೋಲು ಕಣ್ಸನ್ನೇ ಸಾಕು ಮನೆ ಮನೆಯಿಂದ ಸಪೋರ್ಟಿಗೆ ಜನ ಬರ್ತಾರೆ ತಾನಾಡಿದ್ದು ನನ್ನನ್ನು ಪ್ರಭಾವಿಸಲು ಸೋತದ್ದು ಕಂಡು ಒಳಗಿನ ಉದ್ವೇಗವನ್ನು ಹತ್ತಿಕ್ಕಲಾಗದೆ ಕೈ ಬೆರಳ ನೆಟಿಕೆ ಮುರಿಯತೊಡಗಿತ ದಿಸ್ ಕನ್ನಡ ಈಸ್ ಅ ಮಿಕ್ಸ್ ಬಿಕಾಸ್ ಇಟ್ಸ್ ಇಂಟೆನ್ಷನಲಿ ಡನ್ ಇಟ್ ಈಸ್ ನಾಟ್ ಇಟ್ ಡಸಂಟ್ ಬಿಲಾಂಗ್ ಟು ಎನಿ ಪಾರ್ಟ್ ಆಫ್ ಕರ್ನಾಟಕ ಬಟ್ ದೇರ್ ಇಸ್ ಎ ಕಮೆಂಟ್ ಅಬೌಟ್ ಇಟ್ ಲಿಟ್ಲ್ ಅರ್ಲಿ ಅಪ್ ಲೆಟ್ ಮಿ ಜಸ್ಟ್ ಸ್ಕಿಪ್ ದಟ್ ರಾಜ ಸುಮ್ಮನಿರುವಂತೆ ಸನ್ನೆ ಮಾಡಿದರು ರಂಗಣ್ಣನನ್ನೇ ಈತ ಯಾರೆಂದು ಕೇಳಿದನಲ್ಲ ಎಂಬುದನ್ನು ಅರಗಿಸಿಕೊಳ್ಳಲಾಗದವನಂತೆ ನಂದ ತನ್ನಷ್ಟಕ್ಕೆ ಗುಣಗುಣಿಸುತ್ತ ಕೂತ ರಾಜ ಚಾಣಾಕ್ಷ ಮನುಷ್ಯನೆಂಬುದು ಎರಡು ಮಾತಿನಲ್ಲಿ ಗೊತ್ತಾಯಿತು ಒಳಗೆ ತುಂಬಿ ಉಕ್ಕಲು ಹವಣಿಸುವ ಧೂರ್ತತೆಯನ್ನು ಅದು ಬಿಡಲು ಹೆಣಗುವಂತೆ ಅವನ ಮುಖವೂ ದೇಹವೂ ಅಸಹಜ ನಗೆಯೊಡನೆ ಹಿಗ್ಗಿ ಕುಗ್ಗಿ ನುಲಿಯುತ್ತಿತ್ತು ತನ್ನನ್ನು ಅವನು ನಿಗ್ರಹಿಸಲು ಪ್ರಯತ್ನಿಸುತ್ತಾ ಮಾತನಾಡುವಾಗ ಕೈಗಳನ್ನು ನಿಶ್ಚಲವಾಗಿ ತೊಡೆಯ ಮೇಲೆ ಇಟ್ಟುಕೊಂಡಿರುತ್ತಿದ್ದ ಯು ರಿಪೋರ್ಟರ್ ಅಂತ ವಾರಪತ್ರಿಕೆ ಹೆಸರು ಕೇಳಿಲ್ವೆ ಅದು ಇವರದೇ ಯು ಅಂದರೆ ಅಂಡರ್ ವರ್ಲ್ಡ್ ಒಂದು ಕೊಲೆ ಆದರೆ ಪೊಲೀಸ್ಗಿಂತ ಮೊದಲು ಅವರಿಗೆ ಗೊತ್ತಾಗೋದು ರಂಗಣ್ಣ ಅವರ ಇನ್ಫ್ಲೂಯೆನ್ಸು ದೇವಲೋಕದವರೆಗೂ ಇದೆ ಸರ್ಕಾರ ಯಾವುದೇ ಇರಲಿ ನಡೆಯೋದು ಅವ್ರ ಮಾತೆ ಕಾರ್ಪೊರೇಟರ್ಗಳು ಬಿಡಿ ಎಮ್ ಎಲ್ ಎಗಳ ಸಹಿತ ಅವ್ರು ಹೇಳೋದು ಗೆರೆ ದಾಟಲ್ಲ ಗನ್ ಮ್ಯಾನ್ ಇಲ್ಲದೆ ಹೆಜ್ಜೆ ಇಡಲ್ಲ ನಮ್ಮ ಬಾಸು ಅವರೇನೆ ನನ್ನಿಂದ ದೃಷ್ಟಿ ಕೇಳದೆ ಈ ಪರಾಕು ನನ್ನ ಮೇಲೆ ಪರಿಣಾಮ ಮಾಡಿದೆ ಎಂದು ಬಗೆದು ರಾಜ ಮುಂದುವರಿಸಿದ ಇಂಥವರಿಗೆ ಶತ್ರುಗಳಿದ್ದಾರೆ ಅಂದರೆ ಇವರು ಒಳ್ಳೆ ಕೆಲಸ ಮಾಡ್ತಿದ್ದಾರೆ ಅಂತಾನೇ ಅರ್ಥ ಅಲ್ವಾ ಚಿಕನ್ ಚಂದ್ರು ಅಂತೊಬ್ಬ ನಿಧಾನೆ ರಂಗಣ್ಣ ಅವ್ರ ಮೇಲೆ ಒಂದ್ಸಲ ಅಟ್ಯಾಕ್ ಮಾಡಿಸಿದ್ದಾನೆ ಅವನಿಗೆ ನಮ್ಮ ಏರಿಯಾನ ಕಂಟ್ರೋಲ್ ಮಾಡೋ ಆಸೆ ಎಟಕ್ದೇ ಇರೋದನ್ನು ಬಯಸಬಾರ್ದು ನಾವೇನು ಕೈ ಕಟ್ಟಿ ಕೂತೇವಾ ಅದಿರಲಿ ಪ್ರಾಬ್ಲಮ್ಗೆ ಬರ್ತೀನಿ ಇದೇ ಚಂದ್ರು ಗ್ಯಾಂಗ್ನ ಚೇತನ್ ಅನ್ನೋನು ನಮ್ಮ ಮಂಜು ಕಾಲೇಜಲ್ಲೇ ಇದ್ದಾನೆ ಚೀತಾ ಅಂತಾರೆ ಅವನಿಗೆ ಅವನು ಮಂಜುಗೆ ಧಮಕಿ ಹಾಕಿ ನಿಮ್ಮ ಡಾಟರ್ ಜೊತೆ ಏನಾದರೂ ಕಾಣಿಸ್ಕೊಂಡ್ರೆ ಚಚ್ ಹಾಕ್ತೀನಿ ಅಂದಿದ್ದಾನೆ ಸುತ್ತಿ ಬಳಸಿ ಹೇಳಿದ ಸಿಕ್ಕು ಸಿಕ್ಕಾದ ಅವನ ಕಥೆಯನ್ನು ಬಿಡಿಸಿ ಅರ್ಥ ಮಾಡಿಕೊಳ್ಳಲು ಕೆಲವು ನಿಮಿಷ ಬೇಕಾಯಿತು ಅಲ್ಲಿ ಇಲ್ಲಿ ಓದಿ ತಿಳಿದದ್ದು ಬಿಟ್ಟರೆ ಬೇರೆ ಯಾವ ಬಗೆಯಲ್ಲೂ ಗೊತ್ತಿರದ ಜಗತ್ತಿನ ಜನ ನಾವು ಹೇಸುವ ಭಯಪಡುವ ಜಗತ್ತಿನ ಜನ ನನ್ನೆದುರು ಕುಳಿತಿದ್ದಾರೆಂಬುದು ನಿಧಾನವಾಗಿ ಅರಿವಿಗೆ ಬರ ಬರತೊಡಗಿದಂತೆ ಕಳವಳವಾಯಿತು ನನ್ನ ಮೌನದಿಂದ ನಂದ ಉತ್ತೇಜಿತನಾದ ಅವರ ಪೇಪರ್ನಲ್ಲಿ ಮರ್ಡರ್ ಫೋಟೋಗಳೆಲ್ಲ ಫುಲ್ ಕಲರಲ್ಲಿ ಬರುತ್ತವೆ ಯಾವ ಪೇಪರಿಗಿಂತ ಧೈರ್ಯವಿದೆ ಕೆಲವು ಸಣ್ಣ ಅಂಗಡಿಗಳ ಮುಂದೆ ತೋರಣದಂತೆ ತೂಗು ಹಾಕಿರುವ ಪೇಪರುಗಳಲ್ಲಿ ಇಂಥ ಭೀಕರ ಮುಖಪುಟಗಳನ್ನು ನೋಡುತ್ತಿದ್ದರೂ ಅವು
ಧೈರ್ಯವನ್ನು ನಟಿಸುತ್ತ ಇವರ ಜೊತೆ ನನ್ನ ಭಾಷೆಯೂ ಬದಲಾದ ಭಾಸವಾಗಿ ಭಯವಾಯಿತು ಏನೂ ಇಲ್ಲ ಮಂಜು ನಿಮ್ಮ ಡಾಟರ್ಗೆ ಫೋನ್ ಮಾಡಿದ್ನಂತೆ ಸ್ವಿಚ್ ಆಫ್ ಆಗಿದ್ದಕ್ಕೆ ಫ್ರೆಂಡ್ ಹತ್ರ ಹತ್ಕೊಂಡಿದ್ದಾನೆ ನಂದನಿಗೆ ತಾಳ್ಮೆ ಕಡಿಮೆ ಐ ನಿಜ ಹೇಳಬೇಕಂದ್ರೆ ಇವನೇ ಸರಿ ಇಲ್ಲ ಗಂಡಸ್ರಂಗೆ ಆಡೋದು ಬಿಟ್ಟು ಕುಯ್ ಕುಯ್ ಅಂತಾನೆ ಗಂಡಸ್ರಂಗೆ ಆಡೋದೆಂದರೇನೆಂಬ ಪ್ರಶ್ನೆ ನಾಲಿಗೆ ತುದಿಯವರೆಗೆ ಬಂತು ರಾಜ ಮುಂದುವರಿಸಿದ ಅವಳು ಸ್ವಿಚ್ ಆಫ್ ಮಾಡಿದಾಳಲ್ಲ ಅದಕ್ಕೆ ಚೀತಾ ತಾನೇ ಗೆದ್ದೆ ಅಂದ್ಕೊಂಡಿದ್ದಾನೆ ಚೀತಾ ಹೇಳದಂತೆ ಅವಳು ಕೇಳ್ತಿದ್ದಾಳೆ ಅಂತ ಇವನು ಡೌನ್ ಆಗಿದ್ದಾನೆ ಪರಿಸ್ಥಿತಿ ತೀರ ಕೆಟ್ಟಿಲ್ಲವೆನಿಸಿತ್ತು ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಸೋ ಆನ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಸೋ ಫೋರ್ ಒಂದು ಕಡೆ ದರ್ ಈಸ್ ಅ ಸ್ಮಾಲ್ ವೆರಿ ಇಂಟ್ರೆಸ್ಟಿಂಗ್ ಥಿಂಗ್ ಅದು ಹಂಗೆ ದ ಕಾನ್ವರ್ಸೇಷನ್ ಗೋಸ್ ಆನ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಇಟ್ ಎಂಡ್ಸ್ ವಿತ್ ಮುಂದಕ್ಕೆ ಬಾಲಿದ ವಾಲಿದ ರಾಜ ಮೆತ್ತಗೆ ಹೇಳಿದ ನಿಮಗೆ ಗೊತ್ತಾಗಲ್ಲ ಇದು ದೊಡ್ಡ ವಿಚಾರವೇ ಚಾನ್ಸ್ ಸಿಕ್ಕಿದ್ರೆ ಕೋಮು ಗಲಾಟೆ ಎಬ್ಬಿಸಿ ನಾವೇ ಬಗೆಹರಿಸಿಕೊಳ್ತಿದ್ವಿ ಸದ್ಯಲ್ಲದೆ ಬಡಿಯೋಣ ಅಂದರೆ ಏನು ಮಾಡೋದು ಮಾದರ್ಚೋದು ನಮ್ಮದೇ ಜಾತಿ ಸೂಳೆ ಮಗನ ಒಳ ಜಾತಿನೂ ನಮ್ಮದೇ I have to say I was very um, pleased for myself because uh, I felt like an old Bangalorean when I was reading this in English because I recognized that Chikan Chandru is actually Koli Fayaz, right? And there's only some of us here who, who know that. Um, how did you translate this? Were you, um, I, I imagine it's very, very hard, first of all, to translate dialect and then to capture humor because so much of humor is in... punning or in accents or sentence construction how how did you do this because it's very fun, funny in the english too yeah. Yeah, no, a sound fit i couldn't do so the bit that uh, vivek said uh, was a mix of several dialects so in kannada you can actually do it but in english there's no you know reasonable way to describe this so uh, it's just mentioned that what he said was a mix of many yeah, yeah. you know things from many different places and there's no way to say what it was but as for humor i think it is very funny and uh, I, i think i tend to act when i'm doing uh, humor especially when there's a lot of dialogue so i sort of uh, you know enact it while translating it so that it sort of flows uh, naturally and yeah. um, no, i think reading aloud must help a lot no especially when you're doing um, humor but what i love um there are many things i love about this uh, the scene but one of the most um uh graphic for me is you know middle class we all believe that danger is just outside our front door if we keep our door closed nothing can come in right so i'll keep my house really clean but i'll throw my garbage out of the window you know like you know, the the sort of siege mentality that um, you know, oh, sorry this is reminded me of this film uh, called anveshane <coughs> from the 1980s i think where again the middle class couple was very happy and cozy and again they believe that if they keep their door closed nothing will enter yeah, yeah. but one day they all come home and find a corpse lying there and so this is like the worst nightmare or, uh, yeah, you know that everything God. can go to pieces in an instant so yeah. that seems to be the sort of uh, undercurrent of middle class life and it literally comes true in their case sorry to interrupt no 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 um but i also think what's going on in this scene you know like this is the beginning of the book right uh, and you're really just getting to know venkat who is the the narrator and you know the central character um of the story in many ways um and i love the way he's dealing with these thugs right he's like it's okay man you know the kids take it easy how bad can it be you know um and i think um this is actually um a contrast in masculinities right there's this thuggish masculinity oh, i'm wrong and all you know I am, I am. and then this very reasonable upper caste very secure um middle class gentlemen saying oh, i take it easy you know it's my daughter and all that um and i know that in um previous conversations about the book and there have actually been very few because the book is like hot off the press literally masculinity has come up as a as a topic of discussion um and i think uh, um one of your quotable quotes for vekas masculinity if there is a crack also it starts to seep right so did you start out to um to write a book in which these masculinities of modernity are explored or how modernity has impacted 
ideas of masculinity? Now, as I said, I don't write about ideas. I, I, it, it's not about that. It's a, uh, I write about people. There are the characters who actually haunt me. That's really what I want to tell a story. And, and, and the characters, and that is what it, uh, it interests me. And you said about masculinity. What I really said was it's like water. And a hairline crack is enough for it to seep in and go all over the place. And that is true. Because many of us believe that it's uh, not a bad thing, masculinity. To, you know? No, I'm <laughs> really saying. It is a bad thing. And, and even at the deep, deep inside, we feel that some of it may be necessary. Uh, and in the guise of protecting, we, we do it, and, and that is the hair, hairline crack. And then it is all over. Then it, before we realize, it is, it is there. It is there all over without, you know, even... Uh, and, and there is uh, this thing, you know, where uh, there is an incident in, in, the, in the book about uh, the, the TV thing, where there is, this person is sitting, and uh, he is... Uh, he, he he puts on a TV show, and his daughter and wife doesn't like it. But then they cannot say that, you know, ask him to switch it off. But then he is, and it is it is a kind of a violence. It is a kind of, you know, it's a show of masculinity. And also, it is like, uh, see, uh, surveillance is, is a, a kind of, it is a, kind of manifestation of masculinity. It is, you see the governments, you see the people. Why? In, in, the, in a family, in the guise of protecting, we want to know everything that is, you know, where my wife has gone, what is, is she safe, is it not, my children have, has, has she started, has she reached, has she, it's, there's something, something in it, which is, which we don't want to recognize, but really, if you go deep inside, it is surveillance is an expression of this, in somewhere. Right? And refusing to disclose power. is power, is protest. Refusing to disclose it is protest. That's something I've dealt with in, in, the, in the book. Superb. Excellent. Uh, just, oh, I will remember this. Words of wisdom for the 21st century. Surveillance. I, I want to say something yeah. about the masculinity yeah. bit, which is one of the words I had a great deal of trouble translating in the book was the Kannada word gandasu. You know, which, which doesn't seem to have a straight English equivalent in it. All it's, you know, it's mustache twirling glory. Uh, you, I mean, you, man doesn't cut. You, you have it in Hindi, you can say mard. But uh, there is no, there doesn't seem to be the similar, uh, you know, word with the same masculine weight in uh, English. And, and also one of the things I thought about with this book was that the, um, the narrator is uh, sort of he's pretending to be progressive at various times and he's, he's not even recognized his own, you know, deep urge to dominate the women in his life in some, sometimes in some subtle ways, sometimes in fairly overt ways. Uh, but one thing I really appreciated about this was that he suffers for it too. And that is something we have an opportunity to explore in literature, in the space of activism or where one is trying to claim rights, things do get antagonistic and... So on, but in literature, I think uh, you know you can see the picture, uh, you know, from an overview where it, it hurts everyone. So that that is something I particularly uh, appreciate about how masculinity is handled in this book. No, very well said. Um, also, um, you know, Venkat's narrative arc and his emotional arc in these 162 pages is. It's quite remarkable, and I love this metaphor. 192 pages. Sorry? 192 pages. 192 pages. I must have eaten 30. <laughs> uh, no, just, you know, all that happens to him, that, that metaphor of um, it's like a leak, you know, that, uh, like water, that uh, once it's there, then it spreads, and in ways I think perhaps that even Denkert can't control, and perhaps in ways that he can't even recognize for himself, right? But... I, you know, of course, this is a book about Venkat, and um, but there are so many women 
for me, uh, I'm, a, I'm an only child, um, and um, I just saw it as a relationship between a father and a daughter. And this takkar, which is the nat nat most natural takkar a daughter can have in a house, is with her father. Because my father was very lovely, not at all like Venkat. Um, but Venkat is also lovely. <laughs> Not so sure, <laughs> um, but it is the the book is peopled by women, right? And I remember very long ago, um, you told me that um, you grew up with the women of your household. Yeah, you were the little boy who was always in the kitchen. That's why you're such a good cook. Um, and and I I've always been struck, even in Ghatar uh, Ghatar, by your women characters. And I think that's something that you and Girish share. It's that, um, maybe it's a Konkani thing, but, but women are very strong, fully developed, very well-rounded. Um, and this book is full of them, yeah? There are the, the uh, Viji in the city, and Rekha, the daughter, and then, of course, the village has so many more women in various kinds of relationships um, to Venkat and to each other and, and to the other characters. Um, how hard is it for you to imagine a woman character and to inhabit her completely? Yeah? Uh, women are there in all my novels, and they are very strong in, in all, all five, six novels, whatever. And as you said, I, I grew up with uh, uh, a lot of them. And actually, if you really look around, and if you are sensitive, and if you start responding, I don't think we need to make any effort to understand the world of women. Yeah. You know, they are there everywhere. It is, uh, only thing is we have to you know, remove that lens of masculinity a little bit, <laughs> and then we yeah. see it. It is there, and I have always been lucky to uh, you know, have such women, uh, you know, uh, in, especially in my childhood. Mm. Uh, and, and so that, that world is very familiar to me. And as you said, it is it is possible for me to get into a character, a woman character, but it is not possible for me to represent something. You know, I can't represent women. I can't represent not because I don't want to, but it is not possible because a writer. I believe that I am not representing anything. I believe that I am not writing any ideas. I believe that. So for me to write a, about get into the mind. Uh, of a character, a woman character is very much possible because I can visualize, I can see, you know, that is possible for me, very much. And I do it uh, without, uh, you know, I mean, of course there is an effort, but I'm saying I, I love to do it. Yeah. Is it the same, um, is it the same or similar process when you have to create a character who's so unlike you, politically, ideologically, emotionally, um, male character. Um, yeah. No, that is that is different because uh, when a character is created or a character is born, I must say that he, he or she is a character, and I would not like to see the character or confront the character with any ideology. It is easy to start a story with an ideology and and you know kill everything there. You and then it becomes a debate. You debate with uh, with that ideology, and you you then you know bulldoze it with your own ideas. But really, the joy of writing is getting into the character. So if if there is a character, I will not confront a character with a different ideology at ideology level. I will really create a, 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 a confront a character at details level. See, because we may have differences with people in uh, with ideology with many people, but they are they are people. So I start with the details of their lives, and then when you start with the details of their lives, you know what they do, how they behave, because these small details reflect your inner self. They may be very small. There may be how they get up, what they do, what they. You know, all these things, that is something that, that really interests me. Yeah. Rather than confronting a character or uh, dealing with a character of different ideology at an ideological level. That is one. Second is, ideology requires you to be absolutely clear. There is no ambiguity in ideology. While fiction is all about paroksha. You say something, you mean something else. 
you point your finger at something it you you show something else and these two don't go together if a, and that's why i feel at the time of creation if you are driven by an ideology then you are killing the uh, story at the very beginning because you know where you are getting where you are heading all right yeah. um but you know how is it for um for you to translate because it's a given i mean you are you are you are translating what somebody else has written or like you know when i translate valmiki how do i translate against the grain of my own self um let's not say ideology perhaps but you know my beliefs how do i as a feminist how do i feel when i see sentences like you know women are like this and women are like women are stupid and blah blah right it's, it's, for me it's a little difficult to do that how is it for you any kind of difference i mean i don't just mean ideological difference women's voice um like you know uh, uh yeah no i did i did have some trouble with this one you, you know when we were doing ghatar gochar again it was the three of us and there was a question from someone asking about you know how hard it was for me to translate the book and i said once i got into the voice it sort of flowed along and there was one person in the audience who got up and said if you didn't struggle to translate a book i don't want to read it and and i don't know if that person is there here but i struggle to translate <laughs> this one so here's a book you can read uh, so so the director of this thing venkat right so he's kind of semi unreliable i would say he he's not very clear it's, it's a bit ambiguous and uh, he's conflicted he is confused he thinks he is you know there's one part of the book where he says that if i knew the word then i would have said that i was a liberal and he, you know he uh, and he probably has uh, you know he believes it himself but deep down there's something else which keeps emerging uh, now and then in strange ways so uh, it was hard to uh, pin down a narrative voice in this one and i think a lot of the discussions we had later had to do with this Uh, because we took about 6 months to have a draft of this and then we had many discussions about how to get it right and so on yeah that yeah. um yeah there's um you're right he's a slippery guy i mean Very the, slippery, the, the yeah. position keeps um yeah, and, and the thing is also time no yeah, because yeah. Uh, vivek tends to go back and forth in time and at uh, different points he has uh, you know a different level of self awareness or depending on what is going on around him something hidden in him starts you know just peeping out a little bit yeah. and he's the guy who's narrating it so you can't even have that objectivity of you know a third person narrative so it's an incredibly tricky voice yeah you, you uh, no i i just wanted to say venkat is not a bad guy because <laughs> <laughs> because i certainly didn't want to paint him in black and white uh obviously i i'm not even saying he's a good guy so <laughs> no, i'm not saying bad things about him i'm just saying factual things yeah. <laughs> um but there, obviously there were parts that you enjoyed translating very much so why don't you very much yeah why don't you read us something um that you really enjoyed translating yeah i think one of the bits i really enjoyed translating would have been chapter 8 uh, which is which i found very funny and i deeply enjoyed but i think for reasons of not giving the plot away and ruining the book for you guys i cannot read that so i will read something else which i yeah. think makes sense in bangalore uh, it sort of introduces the family and the narrator and so on <clears throat> my name venkata ramana so richly intoned by the teachers at my village school lost the flick of the tongue at its end in the mouths of my north indian friends at engineering college and became venkata raman it then dwindled to venkat among colleagues if i had spent some time in the united states i'm sure i would have turned into a venki perhaps the transformation of my name says something about the path i have traveled and my easy acceptance of it something about the firmness of my convictions i had taken a picture of the family deity with me to engineering college but it never emerged from my bag a boy named harish joined college the same day as me and neatly arranged pictures of gods and goddesses on his table the students pounced on him with such glee that the nickname bhatta priest stuck to him for the rest of his life in the circumstances i thought it best to keep my god confined to my bag after all when you want to win a swimming race you don't dive in carrying weights for months i worried that someone might accidentally see the picture in my bag and spread the word 
with all this going on, I wasn't going to make a fuss about one syllable at the end of my name. I finished my engineering and got a job at a multinational. On my first day at work, a smart elect from HR went on for two hours about company culture, reminding me every few minutes how fortunate I was to have got a job there. He sought my permission with a stale joke. You know, in an emergency, it might be too late by the time your full name is said. Shall I call you Venkat? This reminded me of the custom of changing women's names after marriage. So I joked back. I feel like I'm getting married to the job. He was too smart to get the joke. That is, that is an amazing feeling, he said and laughed. Then he took me around the office and introduced me to everyone as Venkat. No one at home or in the village had called me anything other than Venkataramana, which also happens to be the name of a family deity. Every evening, at the end of her prayers, my mother sought the well-being of the family with an imploring Deva Venkataramana that rings in my ears to this day. When colleagues started calling me Venkat, initially it felt as if my relationship with God too had somehow been diminished. But I got used to it soon enough. Something I have not been able to come to terms with after all these years is the fact that my work has no connection to the electrical engineering I studied. Maybe I should not complain about this. After all, my salary grew steadily everywhere I worked. Even then, I changed jobs from time to time, hoping to be a more important wheel in the organizational machinery. But no matter how attractive a position appeared from a distance, on drawing closer, there were hundreds of wheels just like me. I have also struggled to make sense of just how many rungs of the ladder in a small company amount to a single rung in a large organization. Regular promotions have kept me from being entirely frustrated, but I've never been able to as much as glimpse the top of the ladder I set out to climb. Off late, I don't even clearly see where I can get off and retire. Except in its details, the story of Vijay's professional life is not very different from mine. She did her MSc in mathematics and got a job in the IT industry, which welcomes degree holders of all descriptions with open arms. Since it is hard to tell apart the various organisms that swim in the vast ocean of IT, I will not attempt to describe her role. But it should come as no surprise that her work too has no relation to the mathematics she studied. As a precaution against, being obsol against becoming obsolete, she signs up for courses every now and then to update her technical skills. As a couple, we are not particularly good looking. But we are not terribly unattractive either. We may not exactly be charismatic, but we are not off-putting. We both have a wheatish complexion, and if our physical attributes are considered, then my broad forehead and Vijay's long, luxuriant hair might stand out. But such details are never noticed in the unexceptional, a point proved by the indifferent way in which the others who live in our apartment building know us only as the C3 people. The same neighbors, when talking about a particularly wealthy resident, say, Gupta, the tall man from the first floor. <laughs> the retired colonel on the second floor reminds them of Shashi Kapoor. To put it simply, if you average out various aspects of the lives of lakhs of people like ourselves, you might as well be describing us. Perhaps the only difference is that the cart of our particular existence is drawn by the twin oxen of both our incomes. This has allowed us to advance a step or two beyond the average. It gave us the courage, for instance, to take out a large home loan. We are a two-car household, even if they are small cars. We change our phones easily. We can go to restaurants and toss a card into the bill folder without thinking about it. We believe our friends and relatives see us as successful. But no one spells out what exactly that means. They don't need to. It's common knowledge that the answers to a few simple questions give the measure of worldly progress. A house of one's own? If so, which area? Who is the builder? How many BHK? Make of car? Kids? If so, which school? For people like us, who have successfully passed these milestones, there comes the test of being evaluated by the conduct and achievements of our children. That is where we stand now. Um. This will be our, uh, I just want to ask one more question and then we'll op open it up for you all um, to join the conversation. One of the things that I enjoyed enormously in this book, um, without noticing how important it was, see, when I have to do something like this, I read the book two or three times, yes? So um, each time something new comes 
um, to the fore. But I was, and this is true of Khatar Khotar also, I remembered. Um, place is so specific. Yeah, like um, you can imagine the room, right, where something is going on, or you describe it very, very closely, right? So I, so when I was reading about um, Venkat going to the door and there's a knock, and I was imagining your apartment. I said, yeah, yeah, you must have gone like this. And you know, the other scene, um, there's a later scene where you 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 um, understand the the layout of the landing, and I was completely imagining your house. But you said you had imagined something else completely, and you had imagined yet a third thing. So I'm very interested in this, the imagination of architectural space, you no, know, and how much real places feed into that construction of a, of a, of a fictional, yeah. This space is absolutely essential and important for uh, me to write, for any fiction writer, I guess, because the physical space in many ways decides the relationship between the people who live in that space. That is the first thing. And at the level of writing, I need to visualize, I need to see, I need to see where, you know, how, up, uh, I may not write everything. I mean, I, I know, if I know 100 things about Venkat, I've only written 10. But I need to know that other 90, otherwise I can't write this 10. So I need to know where you move, how you move, at what time of the day, what is the light at that time of the day. You know, every detail is very important so that you use minimum words and absolute, uh, you know, and make it perfect. If you do not visualize it, it cannot happen for me. And uh, sometimes I have, like for example, in Ghachar Ghachar, that house is my imaginary house. It is, I, I imagined that house, that this is how it will be. But there was no physical, uh, there is no physical house existing like, like that. But in this house, I had imagined a house which I had seen, uh, you know, an apartment of, uh, you know, someone who would, I had seen and I thought that's the perfect place for, for, for this. Because certain actions have to happen in that place. You need to have the distance between characters. You need to give that space for people to move from one place to the other. You also need to, uh, you know, create that uh, uh, closeness, and also some kind of, you know, because there is there is a there is I, I talked about this TV scene, and the people, uh, you know, the family has to move away into their own space for which there need to be own space. You know, so that moment I need to visualize. So it's absolutely necessary for me to have uh, something in front of my eyes, whether it is imagined or, or uh, you know, something that I have seen, it is immaterial. Because once you write with that intensity, I feel I have been living in that house. Yeah, yeah, of course. You know, so it is many times people ask me, it is your experience. I mean, yes, it is my experience. I mean, everything that is in this book is my own experience because I, I have written it with such intensity. I have seen the details of their lives with, uh, you know, such closeness. I can't say it is not my experience. That it's, I mean, experience what is experience? Yeah. It is. <laughs> yeah. All experiences are not equally yeah. real or something. Um, but how do you respond, um, Srinath, when you, because as Vivek is suggesting, so much of the space is actually implied, right? That as readers, we don't know if the wall is yellow or green, or there are four dining chairs, or there is a purple rug. And yet we know that, you know, the, the napkin was lying on the table and he picked it up quickly as he went to the door um, and hid it behind his back here. Yeah. So how does, how, how do you as a try? is it as necessary for you to visualize a space? And of course, you can't visualize the same space, right? So, yeah. You know, it is very important because you need to be internally consistent in the book. If someone moves from here to there in one chapter and then does it again, it's got to feel like the same house. So it is very important. So I started, because I've been in Vivek's house and because it's a first person, you know, <laughs> narrative, I started by imagining the hall of his house. And then at some point there was a balcony which is not there in that position in his house. So I sort of took a balcony from someone else's house, I know, <laughs> and I edited his house and put that balcony there. And then there was a corridor and something happens there and the best corridor I could think of was from my, you know, hostel days. I think we did a lot of stuff in the corridor. So that became the corridor to this house. So it's a sort of chimerical space for me, but it is, it's a terrible piece of architecture, but it works for translating the book. <laughs> and 
and it's also like it's like a dream, you know, yeah. when you dream that, oh, I'm in the house that I used to live in when I was eight years old. But it's not that house at all in your dream, but you know it is, right? It can look like something else, but you are very, very certain um, that it is that house. Okay, I'm going to just throw one more thing at these gentlemen and then I promise you, I will let you enter the conversation. So we've been talking uh, for the last couple of days about about the book because we're going to do this and all of that. And I, I'm, um, I'm, I'm uh, feeling very strongly that um, not simply for Indian literature, uh, but for literature as a whole, I think that we are living in a in the golden age of translation. Right? Um, I mean, I you know. Uh, um, Tomb of Sand just won the International Booker Prize for Translation, International Booker Prize for Translation, right? Um, for a translated book. Now, I have to say that I'm completely convinced that it was the success of Ghatar Ghotar and Pirman Murugan's um, One Part Woman. They kind of breached the, the bastions of the literary world in America, right? And so the wind that Tomb of Sand has is on the tails, really, of, of, of these two very, very different kinds of writing that came out of India, right? We also have, like, um, the Korean novel, The Vegetarian, winning another major international prize, right? So um, I think we're very lucky, I think, I'm very lucky to be living in a time where there is so much um, porousness, there is so much sharing of worldviews. And but the question that I wanted to ask both of you is: um, Do you think now, um, because of the kind of attention that good Indian writing is getting in, in the last decade, or not, can we now speak? of an Indian literature that is a kind of comprehensive category, or are we still more comfortable um, thinking about ourselves as smaller and more separate um, linguistic cultures? So it's, uh, <clears throat> one can say that, uh, say that it's Indian literature because the kind of concerns and the kind of politics, the kind of many other uh, conflicts we share with uh, uh, other languages in India. So, uh, Kannadiga and, and uh, Tamilian and uh, Malayali, we all, there are a lot of things which are, which are common to us. At the same time, the narrative and, the, and it's because of the language, the way we have these narrative structures and the, the way we uh, construct these narratives are all different. However, that to give you an example of Latin America, we say Latin American literature, but what comes from Peru and what comes from uh, Colombia, the Marquez and the Cortazar and, and others, they are all different. We can't really say they are they are alike. So similarly, I would say that there is an Indian literature. They are different, but still there is some Indianness, and that Indianness is uh, about the kind, the way we. It's a sensibility. There is a Latin American sensibility. You see Borges, you see, uh, you know, Fontas, or you see, there is a Latin American sensibility. So I think we can probably say that. Um, I, I feel so. It is, it is possible. Yeah, no, I agree. Yeah, I, th I think there are things that are common to us as India. Uh, one example that came to mind was uh, K.R. Mira's latest novel, uh, the Assassin, which uh, deals in part with demonetization. I think a a anyone in India, no matter where you are, can identify with uh, that experience. So it is in that way, although, you know, it, and it does move all around India, but it's such a uh, Indian book in that sense. So I, I do think because we are connected in so many ways, we can talk about an Indian literature. And also I think it depends on at which granularity we are talking within India, maybe you know, we can see much smaller divisions. And But if you're doing this from the great distance of the United States or whatever, I think it's all right to, even Asian literature, no? I mean, there's someone, some interviewer asked me a question about uh, how Korean books and Kannada books have, whatever, you know, breached uh, that wall and made it big. And do you think it's a big moment for Asian literature? And I said, I don't know if Kannada and Korean can be, you know, put together in the, they're not even the same language family. So, 
So I guess depending on where you're looking at, you can categorize them in different ways. Well, they do both start with K, no? Kalana. They do, yeah. And, and lots of people talk about certain Dravidian connections that Korean has yes, and I'm so sure, on. So, yeah. Sure. Okay, very good. I'm sure you've been waiting to join the conversation. Excuse me for going on and on. I was having too much fun. So if you are asking a question, um, please raise your hand. And I believe a microphone will float across the room and empower you to speak loudly. Thank you for the session. I'm really looking forward to reading the book, um, hopefully in both languages. <laughs> um, so my question, I appreciated very much, Srinath, that you said uh, that you, um, you know, the idea of authenticity and having that comfort with your authenticity or lack of thereof when you approach the language. It's something that I grapple with as well. But that thought then led me, uh, when you were talking about the book, to this idea of the rootedness in the village, which is so much a part of uh, many generations of urban Indians. But then there are some of us who, three generations ago, or maybe five generations ago, severed that connection with the village, and the only connection is in your initial of your father's name or something like that. So then I'm, I'm just curious, I, I don't know if you need to have an answer, but I'm just curious about that idea of that rootedness uh, and the authenticity of a fully urban entity, you know, and, uh, and so if you had any response to that. <laughs> I think a lot of my identity does come from having been in a city, but I do see traces of, you know, a past that comes through family and through language. And at home, we speak a kind of Kannada that is spoken in North Karnataka. But here, I went to school, and uh, you know, when I played in the neighborhood, we would speak Mysore Kannada. And at school, at some point, there was this move to find uh, people for speaking Kannada any kind of Canada. So, so I, th I think we uh, like uh, inhabit various overlapping places. And I had a great deal of confusion. And I, I mean, I've written elsewhere that at some point I was in a rock band where I sang in accents I could not speak in. So I, I think our lives are shot through with all kinds of inauthenticity. And uh, that, that uh, I think it's still possible to be human despite these, uh, what I now find fairly superficial forms of inauthenticity. I think I'm kind of over it. I'm, uh, yeah. But Vivek, Kannada is not your home language. Was not when you were growing up. Um, so, yeah. How do you choose the language in which you write when you have emotion, when your emotions exist in more than one language? Yeah. Yeah. My mother tongue is Konkani, but it is... Canada was, uh, uh, and we, I grew up in Karnataka. And Canada is something that I, first of all, it is, uh, it's the medium in which I studied. And uh, more importantly, Canada was the language of the street. And I feel it is very important for a writer to be connected with the language of the street. Otherwise, you have no connection with the folk, you have no connection with the pop. And uh, there is no way I could have written the uh, third chapter in, in this if I did not have that connection. And so that kind of a connection is very important for me. I grew up with many languages. I grew up with five languages. But it happened by chance. But at least I know that you know, my other uh, uh, friends have grown up with three, four languages. It, is, it gives a different uh, way to look at, look at the world. Yeah, yeah. I mean, in some things which are described by Konkanese, it's impossible for anyone else to describe in that way. And Konkani is a language, you know, I feel at some times that it is so good for gossiping. <laughs> and, and that's so good for literature, you know. And, uh, and when I write in Kannada, I, have, I feel I have brought in some element of that into Kannada. And not just me, there are writers like Jayant Kaikini who is here, Girish Karnad who is there and Yashwan Chittal, there are so many writers whose uh, mother tongue is Konkani and who write in Kannada. And I feel each one of them have contributed something to Kannada language. And in, uh, one is in terms of the sensibility, second is also in terms of the language. You know, you have added new words, you have added new phrases, you have added, you know, something new, the way in which the language is, is used. Which I think also that kind of 
osmosis process is happening with what we call Indian English. No, each of us who chooses to write in English is inflecting the language with our nativities, as it were. Um, yeah. Nobody at the mic. Come on, please. I'm trying to articulate as to how I can make myself intelligible. But uh, let me start with your statement that Come you don't just start. The beg your pardon? <coughs> you don't start with the ideology. You don't have an ideology. You completely understand that. I'll, I'll use the word structure. That uh, you don't have a structure, but there's a whole uh, uh, complex landscape around you. Which, you, which needs to be portrayed, and you choose some, as some key aspects of these landscapes to constitute that, that overall, uh, like Elliot did in Wasteland. So my question is that, uh, if I may use the word landscape or metaphor or whatever it is, since you have to use a finite uh, number, how do you hit on those? How do you and, hit? And how, how, do you, how do you hit on those finite number of landscapes or metaphors which you will use to, to bring out the structure of the Amiyas? I'm not sure if I've made myself yeah. clear. See, it is, uh, writing is not, uh, it's a process for me which happens over a long period of time. It is not just the time of writing. I might write a novel in six months or three months, but it has taken nearly 20 years for me to you know, for Gachar Gachar, it took more than 20 or even more number of years. Not that I was writing, not that I was writing in my mind, but that is something which keeps, which is bothering me, which is something that I feel there is something important which I need to pursue. And those details, uh, you know, I, I'm looking for some metaphors, some kind of, you know, those, uh, 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 you know, pointers. And that process is a very long drawn process. Uh, so over a period of time you keep gathering these things and then at the time of writing then you find something and then yes this is what it is because that is I, 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 can, I can say that is what is a tone you find that tone you get that position it is like fixing a camera and you put that uh, camera there and then you start seeing things and most impo and more importantly you don't you see sh show certain things and you don't show certain things and that is that is so to, to find that position to find that camera's position, to find the tone is a search, actually. And other thing I must say is, at least I, let me speak for myself, I, I write a lot in the sense that there are many times you make an attempt. And for a writer, it is so important to understand false start. Even after 50 pages, if I feel that I'm not going anywhere, I should, I should just discard it, and I do it. Because that is what I mean by searching for tone. You, you know that you have gone on the wrong path and if you still pursue and you will end up somewhere else and where, not where you wanted to go. So that, is, that happens continuously. So it, it may look like this is a slim book, but I'm sure I've written so much. And, and not that I keep trying, that it is there. But one must have the courage to discard. You know, there is, one should not be greedy that yes, I have some name, whatever I write, get published. That's not the thing. The thing is to really find something which is, and with all said and done, it is, it is, writing is for me. I am doing, it, it does something to me. If I written this book, it has done something to me. I am a different person after writing this book. And if that doesn't happen, then uh, there is no joy of writing. Well, certainly, I think as translators, we both know that it is the search for that sweet spot. You know, especially when you're translating metaphors or images or something, you know when you've got it, you know? Um, even though, of course, it has changed hugely from one language um, to another, no? Please. Uh, uh, sorry, I, I came a little late if my question was already answered a little before. I have uh, one question to Vivek sir and one to uh, Srinath sir. Uh, Vivek sir, you have uh, Sakina Ada Muthu, I have read it in Kannada, I haven't read the translated version yet. I, I see that a lot of characters, you, you leave it, you don't give all the details, 
we have to assume a lot of things about those characters, be it, be it the girl or the person who helps her to go to meet someone else. A lot of details, only a few details are revealed and a lot of it is hidden. Was it done on purpose? And uh, a question to uh, Srinath sir. Actually, I read Gachar Gochar first in English, then in Kannada. When I read the English version, I thought that is the original version itself. So, <laughs> uh, it, was, it, was, it was so crisp. And uh, I have a friend, we keep talking about Vivek's uh, stinginess in using the words. It's, it's, as if, it's as if he weighs each and every word, including, including the punctuations, and then uses it. Uh, so how do you interact with the original author? And how does that, how does it feel like, ha have there been instances where you complete a chapter, you feel it's, it's right, but then the author says, no, it, 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 it's still not hitting the right tone. So how, how long did it take for you to translate this? Uh, yeah, I mean, basically how you interact and how, how you zero in on the final version of the translated copy. Can I go first on this, yeah, because I want to end with a fun story about that question so that he can continue from there. <laughs> you know, uh, so, uh, it took about, uh, you, you meant about this book specifically, right? Yeah, uh, both, both each other. Yeah. Or maybe we'll just talk about this one since... Uh, uh, it took me about six months before I sent a third draft of my translation to Vivek and our agent, Shruti Devi. Uh, and uh, after that, we took around, it's been about two years to publication. And uh, all the time was spent in getting the voice right. You know, Vivek reads a draft, he compares it with the original. And if there are, pl uh, one of the things that gives me courage to uh, actually write when translating is that Vivek is going to be reading it. And if I've overstepped in any way that, you know, he's going to tell me that this is not what I meant or, uh, and so on. And also I think that there are uh, questions about characters and so in this book, for example, there was a lot of discussion about, because Venkat is such a tricky, uh, uh, you know, narrator, there were questions about can he say this at this point and so on, which, uh, and in some cases uh, uh, Vivek justified why that was possible. In some cases he, you know, made small changes to the book. So, so the translation can be said to be based on the second edition of the Kannada uh, novel, I think. Uh, so there's a, it's a very long process and our agent Shruti is also, uh, you know, she contributes a great deal. So we read, uh, the thing is in Kannada and English, the conventions are different, uh, publishing conventions. So Kannada is more uh, relaxed in terms of repeating words, adjectives and adverbs are not, you know, uh, they, they don't, uh, uh, they don't remove from the literary value of a text. And, uh, but in, in English, that's not the case. And a literary author in Canada should read like a literary author in English as well. So there is, there's a kind of bridge you have to build between languages. And we spend a great deal of effort in uh, doing this kind of work. So that's something about the process. And the story I wanted to tell about uh, Vivek stinginess is, <laughs> is this. Uh, our agent, Shruti, said, you know, there's a seen in the book where there is an emergency of some sort and uh, Viji and Venkat take a bus and go somewhere and uh, Shruti said you know there's this affluent IT couple in Bangalore why don't they have a car and Vivek immediately took offense and said what do you mean they have two cars I have just not written it in the book <laughs> <laughs> Vivek over to you uh, uh, sorry to interrupt you sir. just one more Thing, uh, Let me respond to what you asked in, in the beginning. Uh, see, it is important to create those spaces where clarity is very important for fiction. At the same time, it is important to create those spaces where the reader can connect. And we talked about the house. The house that I had described, that was still opportunity for Srinath to think that, you know, he could construct it himself because he's a reader. And I really want readers to participate. Otherwise, it becomes a passive thing. It's like you know watching something on the TV. But the active involvement is where you don't say things, where you allow the reader to imagine, to put her or his self into it. See, every question answered in a book is not a good book, according to me. It must leave something behind. It must make you go beyond it. it, must, it that search must start. 
So that I feel is very important. It doesn't mean, which is why the first thing I said is clarity is important. Everything must be complete. At the same time, you should feel that it is not complete. It is not over yet. Yeah? Uh, sorry, just one more question. Uh, yeah, sorry for the spoiler who are yet to read the... No, I don't think you should do it. <laughs> no, please, please, okay. no. Then, 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 because then, it, then, it then. affects the uh, experience for the readers who have not read. Okay, sorry, because sorry. some of you have read it in Canada. So yeah. please don't do it. Yeah, yeah? Sure. Thank, you. Thank you so much. You can ask him later, maybe. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Whisper in his ear. Uh, Thank you for this uh, fascinating conversation. I just have um, a couple of questions, but very short. One is uh, about response. Uh, you are one of the few authors who have uh, published both in Canada and in English and have received warm responses in English. So all the comments given here are an uh, indication of uh, how successful the book uh, is in terms of, for example, getting uh, comments from the New York Times and the New Yorker and Guardian and things like that. So what is your uh, reaction to the way in which cr critics reacted to your book in Canada as opposed to in English? And the other question I had was about what Arsha talked about, about how Indian English has been inflected by the uh, so many mother tongues of the people who use Indian English. So there is a, uh, it has been enriched by Marathi, for example, and by Kannada and so on. And in translating it, for example, Srinath probably can talk about this as well. So how much of Kannada have you retained in the English uh, as opposed to making it kind of a quote unquote standard? Thanks. Uh, since you mentioned about the response to Ghachar Gochar, I must say that uh, the book was received very well in Canada. Uh, and when it is in English, the number of, of course, the number of places and number of uh, people who read and respond, in terms of numbers, it was much large compared to you know uh, the Canada uh, critics and articles about it. But. I must say that the response was very warm and good for for Gachar Gochar. People were excited. My friends were excited. It was you know it has run into multiple prints. So book, uh, I believe that the response has been good. And as I said, it is uh, it is interesting because the book is in so many countries and in so many languages. So the response in each of these languages, each of these uh, uh, countries, in not just English, it is very uh, heartening for a writer because I grew up reading. Uh, all translations. I didn't grow up ED, I mean, in, in English. So literature in English, not English literature. So I grew up reading literature in English. So you know, for me to get this kind of a response was very heartening because I felt that I somehow I am also connected to this community of writers uh, whom I grew up reading. So that was a very uh, great feeling for me. Yeah. No, just to elaborate a little on that, uh, Kachar Gochar was translated into many other languages also. No? It's in Turkish and Chinese, Chinese and, and Hebrew. And so just last week I was recommending it to someone from Israel who was so thrilled that there's an Indian book available in Hebrew for them to read. And he immediately looked it up and told me, oh, it has 4.5 stars on our Amazon. So, uh, so, so the thing is, there's this uh, lovely line by Susan Sontag, which says, translation is the circulatory system of world literature. And I think that has happened. He's read widely from you know, world literature, and now it's gone back into that stream. So it's, it's a beautiful thought for me, at least. Uh, about retaining Canada, I try to do some of it. Uh, you know, Canada is uh, very tolerant of long sentences, for example, but it has a different weight in English, so I might try to you know, uh, I, I try to convey what uh, Vivek is trying to do in that part of the thing, not stay faithful to Canada in a very literal way. And a lot of the dialogue has a slight, uh, you know, um, Indian English sort of thing, you know, you know, I, I said this only or something like that, which sort of creates an informal mode and a, a way in which many of us might talk when, you know, we're having a casual conversation. So in small ways, I do try to, uh, keep some colloquialism in it. 
Yeah, one example it comes to my mind of Gachar Gochar is uh, there is a, a scene in Gachar Gochar where the mother uh, she uh, you know wakes up in the night and looking for ants, and in Canada uh, it was it's a serious scene but still it was very light. And when we discussed, I was uh, uh, talking to Srinath, and then I told him it, it must little you know it, it must make it little light and this that. Then Srira, uh, uh, Srinath added a sentence which is not there in Canada is that Amma resorted to chemical warfare. <laughs> and that's so beautiful because this, I could not have written that in, uh, in, in Canada. And it, it's possible only in English and it suddenly lifted that uh, paragraph. Anybody else? Last chance? Yes, please. Uh, but this is the last question because you need to go out and buy books and get them signed and buy one for yourself and buy one for your neighbor and one as a Christmas present. So, yeah. So, last question. Uh, there was a very interesting observation you made about sensibilities. The Latin American sensibilities, the Indian sensibilities. And um, whilst I don't contest that, um, it raised questions in my mind that are they all a subset of all possible human sensibilities to which uh, we become a little more attuned because of language, custom, culture, or whatever? And is there any sensibility in any part of the human culture which could not be triggered by some analogs which can be found in one's own? I would say that it is uh, th that particular comment and point was more for our convenience to understand, uh, uh, you know, from where that literature is coming rather than to, because it is like a helicopter view of things. Like there is a Latin American literature, there's Indian literature. Can we say that, you know, when I see it from that height, is that all, uh, all these geographies are together? Yes. But if you really land, either you land in Karnataka or Kerala or you know, Maharashtra. So I, I would say that is how it is. Because uh, it is not to say that they are all alike. And that's why I gave that example of uh, different writers. Yeah, no, I think there's a lot of uh, uh, philosophizing that's been done on what language does to our perception and our understanding of the world. And I think where it's coalescing is that, yes, what language you perceive the world through makes some difference, but it's not make or break in the sense that, uh, you know, it's not going to change the world entirely. So I guess all uh, languages, when you write may maybe the same story in them, they might resonate slightly differently, but I still think there is something very fundamentally human that everyone is speaking to. But we do try to change the world with language, no? Um, yeah, and I, I think that's very hopeful. So on that hopeful and happy note, thank you both very, very much. Absolutely delightful conversation. Thank you.